Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. This is a pivotal time for our nation and for our city. Each week, from now until November 4th, we'll address the issues, the concerns of New Yorkers, of Americans, and the ways in which the nominees for president and vice president address them and each other. We'll try to assess this extraordinary period with news and government analysts and the newsmakers themselves. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Jennifer Cunningham, political consultant, lobbyist, and legal counsel. She's been called the most powerful unelected woman in New York politics. She may be best known for her work as political director and executive vice president of the state's largest health care union, 1199 Service Employees International Union. Government officials heeded the union's calls for better wages and working conditions. I'm delighted you can join us. Thank you for having me, Cheryl. Jennifer, as political director of 1199, one of your major jobs was as a lobbyist. Um, yet lobbyists get a really bad rap. Is the criticism justified? And what do you see as the good side and the bad side of what lobbyists do? Well, I think some of the criticism of lobbyists is certainly justified, especially those who uh, seek to influence um, and the job of a lobbyist, obviously, is to get legislation passed that's favorable for their client. You know, I had the uh, luxury, I think, of working on behalf of, you know, hundreds of thousands of low-wage health care workers, um, so it hardly felt as though if I were able to achieve my goal, I did not uh, feel like there was anything wrong with it. Um, I think some of the criticism of lobbyists is really quite unfair, and in fact, um, I think sometimes we need to look to uh, the elected officials' behavior. Um, I think lobbying is is something that uh, isn't necessarily inherently bad, but I think perhaps we have a government situation right now that people rightly criticize as being too influenced by the, the lobbyist. I know that you take credit for having helped persuade uh, then-Governor George Pataki to support a health care and health insurance program for the working poor and for convincing the state legislature to, to raise the wages of home care workers from doubled it, right, from $5 to $10. How does one make that happen? Well, you know, the union, I think, had a couple of things going uh, on their side. One is not just, um, you know, I, I think a lot of people, if you ask them, um, is it right that uh, home care workers who, you know, do such, provide such essential services are paid so little themselves and don't have health insurance themselves. I think that was a very appealing message to people. Um, but I think the union was very smart also in realizing that uh, beyond the power of uh, its argument and moral suasion, uh, union members were very active politically, got involved in their community, got to know their elected officials, worked in campaigns. So I think that the union came at it from, from both places, both uh, engaging in politics and mobilizing the members as voters, as well as making the best uh, arguments to the policymakers. You now work as a political consultant for Knickerbocker, SKD a consulting firm whose clients include Mayor Bloomberg, City Council Speaker Christine Quinn, and Senator Joe Lieberman. What exactly does a political cons consultant do for clients like those? Um, primarily, we do. Uh, we produce TV ads, direct mail. Uh, we do some strategic consulting. Um, we also do some basic communications work. Uh, d it depends on the client, really. But I think primarily Knickerbocker, um, we do uh, mail and TV, and we work on behalf of campaigns and candidates. We also represent a, a number of the unions uh, around the country um, and, and here in New York as well. What, for instance, have you done for Mayor Bloomberg that you can tell me about? Um, well, the uh, involvement with the mayor was uh, primarily in his last campaign. There's been some ongoing work um, with him, uh, obviously, when he's been deciding what he wants to do with his future, but I'll, I'll let him uh, characterize that. Um, uh, you know, it really is uh, depends on the client, um, what they're looking for really shapes what we do for them. You were also a key advisor to Andrew Cuomo. Um, in his ca successful campaign for Attorney General of mm -hmm. New York. How does one acquire the skills and the confidence to advise someone on how to conduct a campaign? 
Well, you know, in, in politics, uh, there's an uh, old expression that says uh, anybody that's done one more campaign than you have is an expert. Um, and I think, you know, campaign skills are just something you learn by doing. Um, you know, I've been involved in political campaigns in New York since I arrived here quite some time ago. Um, and just watching and learning, I think you've got to like it, certainly. Um, but, uh, you know, it's uh, it's it's interesting. It's always different. Um, so I don't think there's such a thing as a, a one-size-fits-all campaign strategy. The Cuomo campaign was obviously a lot of fun, not just that we won, but um, it's, it's great every time I pick up the paper and see the great work that Andrew's doing. I assume you've been following the presidential campaign, just like everybody else. I think a lot of Democrats are wondering why, given the numerous failures uh, of the uh, the current administration, uh, and there's a whole litany of things that I could that I could rattle off, but yet the race between John McCain and Barack Obama seems to be pretty tight. I mean, McCain may even, depending on what polls you believe, McCain may even be ahead. What's going on? Well, you know, I think we we still have a very divided electorate in this country, and I think, um, you know, we saw it in 2004. I, I think we have been diverted, I think, over the last maybe week, couple weeks, in, uh, and I think the Obama campaign and some of his allies are getting back on the core message, which is that John McCain, uh, far from being the change agent that he is trying to claim his ticket is, um, would be, a, you know, essentially a third term of the Bush administration. And I think once the Democrats get back on that message and start hanging in there with that and emphasizing what's going on with the economy, um, we will see the race settle down. Um, as to why it is still so close, I mean, I think there are, uh, you know, a, a history of um, tensions going on in this country about uh, this is a this campaign is a very interesting intersection of all sorts of uh, things that voters choose candidates on the basis of. So. I think we're going to have to wait and, and delve into it, uh, I think, over the next couple of years to understand what was going on with the electorate this time around. You talk about there being a very divided electorate. And sometimes um, people, I hear people ask, you know, how could anybody be a Republican? And I usually reply, well, you know, Democrats and Republicans are just basically two very different kinds of people. Mm -hmm. Do you agree? You know, I think. I think in some respects they are. I think there's always frustration among the Democrats. I've heard people say that so often. You know, I think at the end of the day, right now, uh, why, the reason why I think you're seeing the groundswell that you are um, with the Obama campaign, for instance, I, I thought it was amazing that over half a million new donors contributed to, to his campaign in the last month. I think the big thing is that people want government to work for them again. And I think people are less concerned about partisan labels and the bickering than they are about trying to figure out how we can get back to business and how we can start solving some of the you know, very real issues that are facing this country. Sarah Palin has been dominating the campaign uh, for yes, the last couple of weeks. I was watching the uh, the, the Saturday night skit, the uh, spoof of her and Hillary Clinton um, this morning. Um, despite criticisms about her lack of qualifications to be vice president, do you think she's qualified? And, and what do you think of her in general? Well, I, I, I thought the speech she gave um, was very well de delivered. I thought she was very competent, beyond competent. I thought she did a great job uh, at the convention. And for somebody who was just thrust onto the national stage, I think that took an awful lot of uh, a personal chutzpah and uh, moxie, which she certainly seems to have. Uh, um, you know, uh, quite a bit of. Um, I don't personally think she's qualified to be uh, the next in line to be president. Um, you know, it's my personal opinion. I know um, I think there's going to be a lot more coming out about her. We don't know much about her. Um, every day we seem to learn a little bit more. Um, but uh, I, I think the big issue here has been uh, we need to get back to talking about uh, Mr. McCain, as opposed to Sarah Palin, and I think once we start doing that, we'll get uh, back focused on the issues that voters really care about. After a stunning performance in the primaries and a pretty good convention, the Obama-Biden ticket suddenly seems to have gone dead. I mean, just seems to be lackluster. 
why? And if you work for them, what would you advise them to do? Well, you know, I, I know there's been a lot of concern from people about what they're seeing from the campaign or not seeing from the campaign. I think they actually have started to respond a little bit more. I've been seeing some of their latest statements and some of their latest uh, TV ads they're putting up. I think they're going back at um, the McCain campaign as they should about some of the just outrageous distortions of facts that everybody has been picking up on. And I think they're getting a little bit back into being uh, more aggressive and, again, refocusing back on the economy and John McCain, which is, uh, which is I think, where uh, they need to be right now. The Democrats have two good candidates, yet the Republicans seem to do so much better on message. Why do you think that is? Um, or do you think that is? I, I think there is a tendency to uh, of the Republicans uh, to be a little bit more disciplined. Um, you know, you did not see uh, them spending a lot of time in public exploring the differences between the uh, evangelical uh, right-wing uh, part of the party versus the uh, moderate McCain or a former McCain part of the party. Um, they don't seem to uh, discuss it and wring their hands over it in public the same way the Democrats can sometimes. So, you know, I think Hillary Clinton is is uh, famous for saying, you know, Republicans fall in, or Democrats fall in love, Republicans fall in line. Um, I think they are very good about, uh, about maintaining a consistent message. Um, and, and I remember some, some years back um, when I, with a group of journalists visited, I guess it was Terry, Terry McAuliffe was head of the, uh, mm -hmm. the DNC, and I think it was Mark Rasko was head of the uh, Republican National Committee. And Rasko was just very, very much in our 20 minute or so conversation, very, very much hammering the message while Terry McAuliffe was saying, you know, Democrats don't look to me for message. They look for me to raise money. Mm -hmm. And it just seemed to me at that time that, you know, okay, somebody's got to, <laughs> but some, so, the message has to come down from someplace. And that seemed to be um, that it wasn't coming, it wasn't coordinated, it wasn't coming down from on high and wasn't coordinated was a problem. And perhaps it still is, or maybe they're getting better. Well, you know, I, I'd like to think that they are doing a good job, and ultimately the only uh, poll that's going to matter is Election Day. Um, uh, you know, and I think people are... I think people are understandably concerned about what they see and the, you know, pretty amazing fluctuations that we've been seeing here simply because the stakes are so high. I think um, many people feel like this really is a moment in time when you when you opened up your show and, and talked about the pivotal moment that we're at. Um, you know, this is a very serious time in this country and the presidency is a, a huge job. And I think who occupies the White House next is going to have a really big impact on uh, what this country looks like for our kids and our grandkids. We're going to take a short break. We'll be back after this message. Some of New York's most admired figures don't sell out concerts. They'll never be a running back for the Giants. And they probably won't go platinum. But to millions of kids, their teachers are still the biggest heroes in the world. Join New York's brightest. Teach NYC. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York, and I'm talking with political consultant and lobbyist Jennifer Cunningham. Jennifer, I hear the pundits all the time uh, saying that the American people want to hear more specifics about what the individual candidates would do if they were elected. And, you know, if, if they just lay out the spe more specifics in the, in the months to come than um, uh, in the weeks to come, really, now, um, Americans can, can make a decision. But it seems to me that both Obama and McCain have laid out their positions and their, their policy positions at ad nauseum. Do you think voters really want more specifics, or do they tend to vote more based on personality, likability, whether they feel they can identify with and trust the candidate? I think it's a whole package, and uh, when you're talking about an office as uh, about the presidency, um, I think voters really want to feel like they know 
uh, about that person, how the person's going to respond in a crisis, um, how they're going to face tough decisions. So I do think that people want to know about policies, and I think um, they're going to be, continue to t t uh, tune in to this election, and I, I expect the debates are going to be very well watched. And um, But I, th I think really with the presidency, it's kind of a whole package. You kind of want to know what is going to happen in the, you know, what makes the person tick, um, uh, what direction are they going to take this country. And I think it really is more in this case than just how they feel about uh, whether we should drill or not drill um, right now to deal with the energy crisis. I, I know I certainly can't wait to see them debate, you know, really see the, the two candidates together in the, four, you know, yes. two and two, you know, instead of, you know, just uh, going off on their own. The campaign, however, keeps getting bogged down in some pretty petty stuff, you know, whether it's obsessing over pigs, wearing lipstick, or the pregnancy of somebody's 17-year-old daughter, or the meaning of a fist bump. Do you think voters care about these things? And if so, how does it affect how they vote? I, I have to imagine, uh, since uh, the media would stop reporting on some of these things if nobody was tuning in, um, people are paying attention to them again. I think uh, you know some of these are just an attempt to sort of glean more about the people and more and learn more about them. I think though the the you know the 24-hour news cycle and the new media has not done us any favors in terms of having a rational discourse about who's best suited to be president. Um, and I think it really does have a tendency to drive that kind of you know. Uh, every 24 hours, we're dealing with something that really does not seem particularly germane to, you know, we pick up the newspaper and we're seeing two huge financial institutions collapse after right. many others. And yet, you're right, we uh, we tune in to the campaign and we're trying to figure out whether or not uh, Obama favors universal sex education for kindergartens, which of, kindergartners, which of course he does not. So I agree, there is seems to be a real disconnect. I, I think. Um, I think the campaign of the Obama campaign is uh, starting to refocus back on the economy. I, I have to believe that voters care more about um, who's going to bring down health care costs, um, who's going to address global warming, um, who's going to deal with uh, the prices at the pump uh, than they ultimately do about some of these other distractions. Do you think that uh, you're a Democrat, I gather, um, do you feel that um, Obama and uh, Biden have been speaking to the kinds of issues that New Yorkers are concerned about, whether it's housing, unemployment, mass transportation, crumbling infrastructure, the need for health coverage? Um, I think they do to some extent. I think one of the problems, though, with this whole battleground state issue is, uh, you know, some of the problems that are key to urban America and big cities like New York um, haven't been getting as much uh, uh, attention as they uh, might otherwise have. And, you know, personally, as a New Yorker, I would love to hear more about affordable housing. I can't tell you that other than, you know, mortgages, obviously, which is a um, there hasn't been a lot about some of the issues that we face in the urban centers um, from either campaign. Because they sort of take us for granted one way or the other. Either we got them or we, you know, exactly. no chance. Yep. Um, what's pleased you most about the campaign so far? Um, I think what's the, uh, as the parent of a 15-and-a-half-year-old, uh, um, I've been watching a, a new generation uh, tune in and get very excited about uh, politics and what it could mean for their life. And instead of being an abstract concept, this campaign seems to matter to a lot of young people. I'm hoping that we don't just see new registration. I'm hoping that we actually see them go out and vote um, and uh, continue to be engaged in the political process no matter what the outcome is. So, you know, I, I think that has been a, a kind of a wonderful part of watching this. What's disappointed you most about the campaign? I think that uh, the distractions that you were talking about just now, I, 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 I find it very hard to believe with some of the incredibly real things that we are facing in this world and in this country that we have to waste any time on discussions about uh, who's the pig and who's the lipstick. And I mean, honestly, it's, it's, uh, you would think that things were going just fine in this economy, and you would think that working people's wages had continued to go up, and you would think that there was no crisis uh, with uh, home heating oil that's about to hit a lot of middle-class families in this country. So, uh, again, I, I find it I find it very uh, 
not helpful to the political discourse, and I think it trivializes the whole uh, aspect of political campaigns, which I don't think is, is good for anybody. Assuming that the Democrats, let's assume, for instance, that the Democrats win the election, uh, do you think there might be a role in the cabinet for um, Hillary Clinton? Uh, or do you have a kind of dream cabinet, any people in mind for uh, that you'd like to see in the cabinet? I am so superstitious, I won't oh, really? even... <laughs> <laughs> You don't want to jinx it? No, I don't want to jinx it. <laughs> I think certainly there's a ton of talent, and you know, uh, New York's uh, uh, Senator uh, Clinton is, uh, I think, just been fabulous. I, 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 I thought the job she did at the convention was just such a mm -hmm. class act. Mm -hmm. um, I was really proud to be a New Yorker. What do you think about the role of uh, celebrity endorsements? Uh, I guess Oprah's was the most prominent one. Do they play? What kind of role do they play in in, in a campaign? Um, well, certainly they they get uh, the much desired uh, coverage for the day. Um, you know, it's clear that people tune in. I'm not sure that they necessarily change who they're going to vote for based on that. Um, you know, again, I think it goes to the whole question of how do you figure out what that kind of uh, who the person is that you're voting for. And and sometimes I think the comments of uh, celebrities like Oprah, who I think many of us feel like we somehow know her just because right. we see her. So hearing what Oprah says and how she's made her decision, I think is can be helpful in people putting together the puzzle. Ultimately, you know, I, I think it's uh, it's less clear whether or not that translates into any change at the voting booth. I suspect what happened with the Oprah endorsement was was that it made people who were sort of skeptical about Obama and that he could win. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, you know, say, well, maybe I'll take a look at him if she's willing to, you know, to endorse him yeah. and not just say, you know, oh, he can't win, so so we got to support Hillary Clinton because she has a better chance. Very similar, I think, with uh, Ted Kennedy's endorsement. It mm -hmm. was a it was a sign of real viability, and um, in that campaign, uh, when a lot of people were thinking, you know, we like him, but uh, it, can he really uh, win the primary and can he win the presidency? So I, I think you're exactly right on mm -hmm. that. The Democratic Party primary campaigns, the caucuses, the votes, the different voting requirements, sort of a morass, it seemed. You think, is that ever going to get sorted out or anytime soon, do you think? Um, well, I, I, you know, if voter fatigue is the basis on which we decide to reform the system, I, I think that we, uh, it was an amazing, amazingly long process. At the same time, a lot of people really got engaged. Uh, there was more people viewing the Democratic debates and tuning in uh, for cliffhangers on, you know, every time we had a primary, it was going to be the last primary. So, you know, to some extent, it I think it did serve the purpose of educating and invigorating the electorate. How did the Republicans um, distance themselves from President Bush and Vice President Cheney, not only personally but in terms of programs? Isn't that a challenge for them, or not? It's it's I don't know if well, it is. Well, I. Um, I, I think it is a challenge for them uh, uh, tuning into the Republican convention. The tack they took, which I, I thought sort of belied reality, was uh, they assumed the change mantle as though um, they had not been the party in power for the, for the last, last eight, eight years, years. including you know John McCain, who has a, a voting record of close to 90, 95 percent of siding with the Bush administration. I, you know that was a that was a pretty bold approach. Um, uh, I, I think they also were very concerned with how to handle the actual presence of uh, President Bush, which, um, you know, fortuitously they had a, a hurricane to fall back on, and he could not be a, a big presence at the convention. I, I don't think anybody thought that that was going to be helpful for that ticket. Mm -hmm. What's your, and I know it's a huge question, but what's your biggest concern about the national political scene going forward? I think if we can't fi find a way to actually get government functioning again, um, we are going to uh, suffer a real crisis uh, uh, that's going to impact a lot of people. I mean, there are big issues that are just tied up and seem 
irreconcilable. At the same time, you've got more voters, a uh, plurality of voters, thinking that we need to do something about health care coverage and health care costs. Uh, people feeling like we need to do something about energy. You know, the public and is not and in immigration. The public is not divided on the issues. They might be divided on the candidates. But I, I think that if we can't figure out a way to make government work again, we are going to be in uh, even deeper trouble than we are in this country right now. So, if you had to send a message to your message to the voters in 30 seconds, it would be. I think um, we should look at who's really going to be able to change the culture in Washington and actually bring about a government that works again for people, because I, I think that's what we really need right now in this country. I, you know, I think John McCain and Sarah Palin will be another third term of the Bush policies and the Bush administration. I don't think it's worked. And uh, so I'm, I'm right on the change message with uh, Barack Obama. Okay. Our thanks to Jennifer Cunningham for joining me for the City University of New York and one-to-one, -one, I'm Cheryl McCarthy.